Hi, so I'm Gene Becker, and uh, I'm from Samsung, and I'm here to talk about design principles for the internet of, well, people, places, and things. And uh, this is one of those slightly more forward-looking talks, so there's not going to be any coding exercises or anything in this talk. Um, just a little bit about where I'm coming from. Uh, so right now I work at Samsung in a uh, place called the Service Innovation Lab. We work on user experience, design, and technology. And uh, we're the folks that did some of the original design work, visual and interaction around Milk Music, and also the Le LeBron James sports app uh, earlier this year. And we have other stuff in the pipeline as well. In a previous life, I worked on augmented reality on the mobile phone with a company called Layer out of Amsterdam. Um, also worked on some cloud computing projects with uh, friends at DreamWorks when I was at HP. And back in the dark ages, worked on a program called Cool Town at HP, which was uh, all about a web-based architecture for, well, ubiquitous computing, internet of this, that, and the other thing. And the kind of things that we worked on were around mobility, context awareness, physical hyperlinks, including what now folks call beacons, um, connected devices, definitely, smart environments, web presence for people, and spontaneous interaction. So, I think these are all things that are going to bear on the stuff we're going to talk about today. OK, so the Internet of Things. It's big, right? All the analysts say it. All the companies say it. It's going to be big. Cisco, 50 billion connected devices in 2020. Right? I mean, we all know that there's a lot of hype around this, right? A $1.2 trillion market. Who doesn't want to be part of this? Right? This is good stuff. Um, yeah, I would agree. There's a lot of it out there. Right? But I think from a design perspective, from a user experience perspective, as well as from a technology perspective, we have a ways to go. So let's think a little bit about user experience and kind of where does this stuff come from. So William Gibson, science fiction author, noted guy, author of Neuromancer, coined the term cyberspace back in 1982. So the internet was pretty young at that point. Uh, I think they had just agreed on TCP IP as a global standard. And, uh, you know, the fantasy of cyberspace was this incredible place that you go to to escape the physical world. It was about cities of data, worlds of Warcraft, a second life. So there was this notion that basically you went into the computer, you went into the network, right? That was what cyberspace was about. So a few years later, up in Palo Alto in the Xerox Park Lab, Mark Weiser and his merry band came up with this concept of ubiquitous computing, affectionately known as Ubicomp. So that's about 1988. And what they said is that basically computing is going to spread out into the world, that we're going to have all kinds of devices, and they're going to be basically as cheap as paper. And we're just going to pick them up and use them. They're going to be inch-sized. They're going to be sort of foot-sized. They're going to be wall-sized. Computers are going to be everywhere. They'll be ubiquitous. Um, one of my favorite parts about their technology research program was that they, they hired a guy who was more like an arts guy, Rich Gold. And, and he did these great sketches of what does it mean to be Ubicomp, right? So this is uh, something he did around a uh, project art in the age of Ubicomp. And it's all about the world, the mundane world of things becoming connected, right? Your toaster, your fork and spoon and knife. Actually, it's a little crazy because if you go out and search Google right now, I think you'd find examples of everything on this page happening in the IoT world right now, uh, right down to the forks and spoons. So. Um, kind of prescient in a way. But this does also beg the question, if all these things can talk, what are they going to say to each other? Right? Why do they want to talk? What's it for? So this idea that cyberspace is a place you go has been turned inside out. Or as Gibson said a few years ago, cyberspace has everted. Right? It has become inside out, and now instead of going into the world inside the computer, the world is full of computation and data, and this is now our lived experience in the world. So when we think about the user experience of the Internet of Things, 
Um, we're thinking about what it means to walk around in a world that is essentially cyberspace turned inside out. We're living in second life, except it's our first life, right? We're living in worlds of work craft. So it's not just things. I mean, if you look at the kinds of technologies that have been bursting on the scene over the last several years and probably will continue, I mean, there's this enormous explosion of things happening, right? Definitely in the IoT space, but also 3D printing, machine vision, artificial intelligence, robotics, right? I mean, Google has self-driving cars and, you know, big dog robots that, that carry military stuff through the woods. What does that mean? Um, what does it mean when displays are starting to become flexible? Uh, what does it mean when social media is not only a thing that people do, but also that increasingly buildings and other objects participate in? Um, what does it mean when uh, the, the room you're in can watch you and see what you're doing and see who you're with and be responsive in some way? Um, the implications of this are just nuts. Nobody knows where this is all going, right? But I think what we can say is the world is truly becoming a platform. But if you're a developer, you're looking at this platform and going, okay, what do I do with this? Because it is the world's craziest platform. Heterogeneous, distributed, messy, from 1,000, 10,000, 100,000 different vendors, including you know, how many Kickstarters are, are, are there out there making IoT things right now, right? And probably five or 10 more every six hours. So the world platform is kind of a messy thing. And that's just if you're a developer. If you're an end user walking through this world, wow. Okay, so we need to think about some design principles. First thing I'm going to assert, we'll come back to this, is that people and places are just as important as things, if not more important. And so all three of those things should be first class entities when you're thinking about developing a system. And when you're thinking about how you interact with a system as well. Those are all players, those are all actors. Let's talk about data. Okay, so everything that's connected these days seems to be thinking about pulling in data. A few of them give it back to you, but mostly they don't. You know, I, I think in a world of web services like Google and Facebook and so on, you know, there's a bargain to be struck, right? We'll give over, give over some of our personal data in return for free services. Um, but in a world where your thermostat and your toaster and your car and the door at your workplace are all collecting data, um, it's not so clear what the bargain is, right? And where your data is going and who it's going to and how you could possibly control or even know what that is. Um, service creation. Okay, so if we've got a world of many things or people or places, uh, and they're all basically being driven by, you know, many companies with many agendas, uh, you're not going to get a nice clean system built together. So we have to think about modularity. And so if everything is creating a service, then we have to think about modular services. And I think if we want anything more than just one device, one service, we have to start thinking about composition. How do you put them together? Okay, how do you combine the service on your car with the service on your phone, with the service on the light switch in your smart home? Um, it's not an easy problem. There's a lot to do here. So if we think about distributed computing, um, which of course has been around for decades and decades, um, and we think back and try and imagine what, what examples in distributed computing do we have where there's been a successful platform where everything basically just talks to each other on a, on a basically interoperable basis. Everything just works. Well, I don't know. I can think of one, and that's the web, right? And if we don't have something like the web, we're going to end up in standards committees, and we're going to end up in consortia of industry giants, and we're going to end up in 
basically a mess. If we don't have something where people basically agree on a set of protocols, a set of standards to name things, to address things, to interact with things, move data back and forth between them, and it better be sort of open, right? Um, otherwise, we're just not going to see the potential of this new world really played out. Um, I think there are a lot of folks out there who are saying, well, we're, we're definitely web, right? We're doing RESTful interfaces. Um, okay, that's a good start. Uh, there's a lot more, right? I'd say if we look at the interoperability between different systems, we'll find it's problematic. So user experiences, well, they should be harmonious. Um, that's kind of a fuzzy principle, right? Um, they're probably not going to be harmonious, really. Right? We're going to be, as people moving through our lives, going from place to place, moving through different contexts, interacting with different things, and every single one of those interactions is going to be with a different service, maybe a different service provider, maybe a different company, maybe a different technology stack entirely. Um, so how will experienced designers, on top of that, create something that can actually feel like a reasonable continuous experience that we want to actually live inside? One thing also we, that we need to do is we need to think about keeping people in the loop. So there's a lot of emphasis right now in the tech world on automation. Right? Let's figure out how to do something completely automated. Right? You don't have to ever touch it. There's no interface. Well, guess what? Automation is hard to get right. right. If you're doing this thing in somebody's life, it's really tough to get it right. And so you're probably going to want to keep your user in the loop, give them the ability to get their hands on the service or the device that you're creating. Don't just assume that you can do the thing automatically that's always going to be right. Um, the other thing to think about here, and this is maybe more philosophical, is uh, we need to give people agency, right? Automation is great. There's definitely examples where automation helps us. It makes our lives easier. It's more convenient. But at some point, when we start automating the very fabric of our world, we need to think about what does it mean to actually live in that, right? I don't just want things conveniently to happen for me. I want to be made smarter and more capable with my tools so that I can make things happen in the world. And that's a difference, right? I think we need to be thinking about how do we create human agency rather than take it away through complete automation. I don't want Google to think for me. Right? I want them to support my thinking. All right, so let's make this slightly, slightly more concrete with uh, a scenario. So if you've been in UbiComp or Internet of Things for any length of time, I think you've, you've probably heard something along the lines of the scenario trope that says, well, you know, a couple of people walk into a smart home, and X and Y and Z happen. So let's take that example. Let's kind of play that out. So a lot of people like to think about music and about shared playlists. Wouldn't it be great if two guys walk into a smart home, one of them lives there, one of them's a friend, and hey, in the living room, there's a connected music player. And oh, by the way, there's some kind of cool programmable lights over here that you know, can make neat lighting effects and you know, set the mood for you. So wouldn't it be entirely reasonable to imagine that when these guys come in, that somehow their shared preferences are sort of communicated to the music player, the music player figures out a great playlist automatically, and the music plays. And oh, by the way, the lights do cool things right in time, right? and customized so that they kind of focus on the colors that the two guys like and avoid the colors they hate. It's like, oh, I hate orange. Don't go orange, right? I, I think maybe a lot of us have told those stories and thought about trying to build those stories. And certainly when we look at the marketing for Internet of Things, you see a lot of these things out there, right? Could be cool. Could be really cool. Now let's think about what it takes to actually do that. So someone came into the room. How did we detect that? How many people came in? How do we know that? Uh, well, who are these people, right? And when they come into the living room, it's like, what rights do they have there? So the guy that lives there clearly has higher rights, or I should say most likely has higher rights than his friend, right? But I don't know that. I would imagine people are going to say, well, I don't want just anybody to walk into my smart home and control it, so there has to be some kind of permissioning. So how do you set those permissions? Where do they live? 
Um, who knows about these people? How do you identify these people? Do they have an identity somewhere in the cloud? And is it communicated through their phone when they walk in? Or is it communicated through face recognition in the environment? Um, a lot of questions just about that basic recognition. So, great, there's a music player here, and it's connected to the net. And there's some lights here, and they do stuff. Neat. So how were those devices discovered? Was there a protocol that you know, somehow brought them together with this capability that knows about the people that came into the room? How do we know what capabilities those music players have? Right? Do they have some kind of a description language that they publish? And who do they publish it to? And who knows how to read that language? Um, do they offer services? Well, probably. If they're connected, they probably offer services. So what are those services? Um, are there controls over access to those services? Who gets to actually decide who gets to control them? What, whose programs get to access them? Um, how do they communicate? And how do they communicate with the user? So great, there's a music player, there's lights, there's a shared playlist service here. Well, what developer built that playlist service? Was it the, the guys and girls who built the music player? Was it the smart home hub developers? Was it some third party that basically distributed this playlist service through some kind of gigantic smart home app store? I'm not sure. Yeah. And great, is there a UI? So if we say we want to keep humans in the loop, it's like, how do I use this thing? Does it just happen automatically when we walk in? Or does it ask the owner of the house whether to do this? Or does it ask both people, do you like these music choices? I don't know, how does that work? And, and what device does it go to? Does it, uh, does it go to my phone when I come in the room? Right? Is that where the UI is? Or is the UI sort of on a box across the room? Or is it hanging on the wall? Or is it I just wave my arms and some 3D gesture sensor knows it? Um, Many, many, many questions um, not answered so far, as far as we can tell. OK, so let's pretend that all that stuff did happen and a playlist got built. So now what? How do I know what the two people like? What do you like? Is there an interest profile? What is an interest profile anyway? Right? And how do I get to it? Do I somehow, through that person's identity service, get to a place where I can ask what music you like? in some form that the playlist service can then parse and convolve through some algorithm uh, in order to spit out the right stuff in the room. Um, does it matter what the context is? You know, should we have, I don't know, different musical selections, whether it's day or night? Um, you know, whether it's Monday or Sunday or, I don't know, whether it's like one of the guy's birthdays. There's a lot of things that you could do, but where does all that information come from? OK, finally, the music started playing. And the lights are pulsing. Great. So what lighting effects? How did the lights know, right? Are there rules that govern how the lights and the music interact? There probably have to be something, right? Like, you know, when rock and roll plays, then match the beat. OK. I mean, these are independent devices from independent companies. So how do you kind of put them together? Um, who wrote those rules? Um, I see somebody in the back who writes those rules. Wave your hand. Um, are there hierarchies of rules? So like, great, you know, there's a, a smart room that has a music player in it, but are there smart house rules as well? Does the house say, well, no loud music after 10 PM? And you know, how does that factor in? And then finally, well, gee, I didn't tell you there was a drop cam in the room, but there is, right? There's a hidden camera that we use to monitor security in our living room. And, you know, friend comes over and goes, wait, I'm on camera. Where's that going? And then finally, and not just a rhetorical question, are we having any fun, right? At the end of the day, is the experience that's provided by all of this stuff coming together in these unspecified ways, is it fun? Is there a great user experience behind this? And how do you make that happen? OK, so I'm asking a lot of questions here, right? I'm going to ask more. I did say this was a forward-looking talk without any code. So this does raise questions of the architectural framework. So you know, how do you actually create a framework for physical entities? How do people and places and things get represented programmatically? 
Um, how do you discover devices and services in a physical context, in a room? What are the protocols that you use to do that? How do you bridge all the different things that need to come together? Right? The music services, the identity services, the music player, the lights, the smart home. Um, those things need to be able to talk to each other, right? Um, can you authenticate with those things? Can you exchange data between them? Uh, right now, I think uh, we, we find that some systems care about doing that a little bit, and most systems don't. Some systems are basically push systems. They'll give you some data. Some systems are polling systems where you have to go get the data. Um, some systems use friendly data formats like JSON. Some use unfriendly data formats. Some use scripting languages. Some rely on if this, then that. Uh, so many different ways that things are trying to interface, and nobody's talking to each other. Um, so yeah, so how do you develop services in a world like this? Right? How do you compose them? What's the security model? Okay, big unanswered question I'd say for most of the folks working in this space is what is the true security model? And especially when you start thinking about putting things together. Let's also talk about user experience. So when I come into the room, what is my mental model, right? How do things work, right? Do I think about the world as a place where there's like these automatic magic doors that open for me everywhere, where things just magically happen, the right things at the right place at the right time? Or is there something that I need to know about so that when, it, when, when I'm in a place, I know what's gonna happen, right? I know that there's gonna be something that's gonna ping me on my phone and say, hey, here's a UI for the thing you wanna do. Friendly UI. Um, what are those interaction models for encountering things spontaneously in general? How do you walk up to a device and know its name and know how to make it work? Right. Seamful UI. A lot of people in marketing especially like to talk about seamlessness, right? We're gonna have a seamless solution. It's gonna work seamlessly across everything. Well, I, I don't know. If you take anything away from what I said over the last few minutes here, it's pretty clear things are not gonna be seamless. So maybe now we need to think about this a little bit differently. How do we make beautiful, seamful user interaction, user experience models where we actually recognize the boundaries between things and celebrate them and make them really clear and make the implications of crossing those boundaries clear, make the implications of me walking into my friend's smart home a little bit clearer rather than making them invisible and trying to do things that are just like perfectly automated. And of course, there's the small question of, well, what is a good experience anyway? Right? What is a good experience? You know, if most, most experienced designers have been working in flatland. They've been working on screens, whether they're web or phones or watches, you name it, right? Those things are all kind of flatland. Uh, but we all live in a very three-dimensional, non-flat world, right? And now we need to think about what is a great experience in the real world, right? And so we can't just look to technology anymore. We have to look to things like the performing arts, for example. You know, Kids playing on a playground, that's a great experience. People going to the theater, that's a great experience. How do those things start to apply to a world where you're trying to create computational things, digital things, media things around people in the physical places they live? So I think thinking about this from a truly multidisciplinary way and thinking about it in terms of new disciplines that aren't at the table today that probably should come to the table could actually be really useful in parsing this out. Okay, more user experience questions. So this whole personal data thing, right? How are we gonna do this? Today, basically, we have almost no rights in our own data, right? How are we gonna get that? Um, where is the data gonna come from? How are we going to access it? How do we ensure that it's correct? Think about even like your, uh, your credit history right now. How do you know that your credit history is right? You, typically when you go look at it, it's like, well, I don't know, maybe, maybe not. Or if you look at like your, um, some of the uh, data brokers out there will allow you to see what data they have on you. And you go, okay, so am I a 29 year old African male? No, not exactly, right? And yet these things matter. Getting the data right matters, um, especially if it's gonna be used to personalize your experience in the world. 
uh, getting some control over it, maybe even having some ownership of it, having some rights in it. It's kind of a big deal for us. What about the user understanding what's in their data? So that music scenario scares me, right? Because if I go into my friend's house and some of my guilty pleasure music listening tastes start surfacing, it's like, <laughs> you know, whether it be like, you know, Swedish death metal or something like that, and <laughs> or, you know, I don't know, Britney Spears. But not everything that's in the database necessarily has the same sort of level of you know, sort of outward bound sharing around it. Okay, and then there's, well, then there's a little question of ethics. And, you know, we talked about the drop cam in the living room. So, you know, what are the ethics of data collection? And, you know, maybe let's just take ourselves out of our little sort of first world problem scenario of a shared music playlist and think about a person who's walking into a grocery store and maybe there's something about the way that the grocery store markets to people that depends on demographics or income profiles or you know time of the day you name it right at some point we start to think about okay what are the what are the dynamics of power here what are the ethics around providing services in this world that we all live in we can't opt out of the physical world right we're here all right so, the design principles. People, places, and things, first class entities, personal data, ownership, and control. By the way, Sandy Pentland uh, from MIT has a really interesting take on personal data ownership. He's uh, been basically evangelizing this notion of a new deal for data, basically to reset and actually give people explicit rights in their data, the, the right to actually own it, to control it, to delete it. Um, and there's a sort of somewhat quiet movement out there, mostly in the fringes, mostly not in the US, where people are starting to wrestle with this question of, can people own their data? Can they have control? Can they at least see what's in there and get it right? Um, creation through composition, the web model, right? Let's have everything talk to each other. Um, so we already actually have a pretty good model, the web. And we can actually leverage a lot of what's in the web community to make the internet of things, the web of things, start to talk to each other. Um, we have to wrestle with this notion of user experience because it's the world that we live in and we want to get it right. We have to figure out how to keep ourselves, humans, us, in the loop. Or as uh, Bruce Sterling likes to say, and he said this to a gathering of folks very much like you guys. You are the world's first pure play experience designers. You're, ex you're designing experiences for the world. So get it right. And that's it. All right. So thanks for putting up with that. And uh, take any questions if folks have them. No questions. Stunned silence. <laughs> yes? I don't know if this is a real mic. Um, on your last slide, one of the bullet points was service creation through composition. Can you expand around what composition means? Is that synthesis? Is that independent services creating a new service when they come together? Yeah. So, well, the simplest example that I can give of that is if, right? If this, then that. So they bring together different services. Services create interfaces, and you can be an input or an output, right? So if condition A on service A, then you know, action B on service B. Um, really, really simple example, and it's something that you know, kind of follows a very incredibly simple rule, but uh, I think that's where we start, and we have to think about now, how do services start to advertise their capabilities? How do you have a lingua franca of capabilities between services? How do you compose them together? Yes? Do you have any anthropologists or sociologists working for you and what have you learned about the situation? Not at the moment. Um, but actually, a lot of the things that I've said about design principles are informed by former colleagues who've been in those fields and who have actually thought about these things. So thanks. OK. Yeah. The um, example you used about walking to a home, turning on lights, and then turning on music, 
Um, a lot of the systems that people are building to automate the home like that are very rigid like that. They're very static, like every time I enter the home, something's going to happen. But your experience in the world is much more impulsive. Um, sometimes I, I don't want to turn on music. Yeah. It just really has to do with how I feel. So I'm, I'm curious um, what your thoughts are around that and how you think systems might be able to take into account just the human emotion and impulse. Yeah. Yep. Well, so one approach is to build the perfect intention and mood de detector. And, you know, you laugh, but it's like there are people out there who are definitely trying to do that, right? Um, I, I think the other just lies in um, the way that you approach design is you create suggestions, and then you find a way to present those to people. It's like, you know, I'm, I'm not going to necessarily do things all the time for you unless maybe you tell me Every time I come in, just turn on the lights. Every time I drive into my driveway, turn on the front light, right, if it's dark out. So maybe there are some rules that over time kind of get reinforced. The system can observe that and say, oh, looks like you really do this all the time. Should I just do this for you all the time? Right, so, so learning systems. So learning systems, yeah. yeah. Yes, in the back. Uh, this was a forward-looking statement. <laughs> okay, if there's nothing else, then thank you very much. And I can talk to folks offline after this. Okay.